The United Kingdom has set out a deliberately cautious approach to the Royal Navy's surface escort renewal, pairing the drawdown of veteran Type 23 Duke-class frigates with the stepwise introduction of the Type 26 and Type 31. What could have been a cliff-edge risk is being treated as a managed slope. Ministers insist the plan is anchored in operational availability rather than an industrial calendar, with out-of-service dates for Type 23s reviewed constantly to keep enough holes forward deployed. That message lands at a moment when Norway's decision to field a fleet of Type 26 anti-submarine warfare frigates alongside Britain changes the calculus in Northern Europe, promising tighter interoperability and a thicker ASW screen across NATO's northern flank. The strategic logic for this pairing is straightforward. The Type 23s have been workhorses for three decades, but the threat environment they were designed for has evolved into a contest increasingly defined by undersea stealth, long-range sensors, precision munitions, and critical seabed infrastructure vulnerability. The Type 26 is built precisely for this world, quiet by design, optimized to hunt submarines and shield high-value units, yet flexible enough to embark uncrewed systems and operate a Merlin or Wildcat helicopter. Combined with the Sea Scepter missile system and a 5-inch Mk-45 gun, it offers a credible balance between area air defense, surface strike, and undersea dominance, while preserving margin for rapid systems refresh as technology and tactics shift. Industrial execution is central to credibility. BAE Systems Yards at Govan and Scottsdown on the River Clyde carry the responsibility of translating design promise into operational reality. HMS Glasgow is fitting out, HMS Cardiff and HMS Belfast are moving through build, and this pipeline matters beyond Navy headcount. It anchors skills, validates supply chains, and sets the cadence for capability entry without overpromising on dates that a complex maritime program may struggle to hit. By keeping the public narrative focused on availability and operational commitments, not just launch ceremonies, the Ministry of Defense is signaling that schedule will follow capability, not the reverse. Norway's move to procure five ships of the same class is the strategic multiplier. Operating common hulls across adjacent patrol areas simplifies everything that actually wins wars at sea, shared training syllabi, common tactics and procedures, interchangeable spares, harmonized software baselines, and a data feedback loop that improves acoustic libraries and sensor fusion for both navies. It also shapes deterrence. A submarine commander contemplating the North Atlantic now faces a network of sensor-rich frigates that hear, think, and act in broadly similar ways, compressing detection timelines and raising the risk of counterdetection with every maneuver. In peacetime, that shared architecture accelerates day-to-day -day readiness and enables leaner logistics when ships plug into each other support ecosystems. Balancing the numbers through the transition is the hard part, and London is right to treat it as a living plan. Type 23s must be sustained safely and affordably while new hulls arrive, crews must be grown and retrained without hollowing out either force, and refit cycles need to be sequenced to avoid valleys of death in escort availability. This is where continuous review of out-of-service dates becomes a capability tool rather than an accounting footnote. Stretching a Duke-class frigate a year to cover a gap may be cheaper and less risky than surging a new hull early with immature systems or thin manning. Conversely, retiring a particularly maintenance-intensive ship on time can free resources to accelerate trials and integration on a Type 26 that will deliver greater operational effect per day at sea. The presence of Type 31 in the mix helps absorb the strain. As a general-purpose frigate, Type 31 is not conceived as a premium sub-hunter, rather, it expands the envelope for maritime security, coalition escort, reassurance patrols, and presence operations that do not demand the exquisite quieting and sensors of the Type 26. Using Type 31 to shoulder routine commitments allows the high-end ASW inventory to concentrate where it matters most, carrier strike protection, choke point coverage, and the protection of undersea energy and data corridors. This complementarity is the foundation of a balanced escort force, not a compromise. A managed transition is also a people strategy. The Royal Navy's ability to field capable ships rests on engineering depth, 
tactical acumen, and retention of sailors who can operate, maintain, and fight increasingly complex systems. Phased introduction mitigates training bottlenecks and gives crews time to internalize new doctrine and human machine teaming concepts. Norway joining the Type 26 enterprise should enable exchange postings and shared training pipelines, multiplying the talent pool without duplicating effort. In an era where high end skills are scarce, that is not a side benefit, it is a decisive advantage. Risk remains, as it does in every major naval recapitalization. Supply chain shocks, software integration challenges, and the relentless physics of acoustic performance can introduce delay and cost. The antidote is disciplined configuration control, realistic test points, and ruthlessly prioritized capability increments. The Type 26 design choice to host uncrewed systems and modular payloads is a hedge against uncertainty, letting the class spiral upward without tearing out its innards for each new sensor or effect. If managed well, capability grows through software, mission packages, and data integration rather than through structurally disruptive refits. Politically, the optics are favorable. The UK can present a story of allied convergence around a British-designed, export-validated ASW frigate that directly serves NATO's most demanding maritime theatre. It can link shipyard output to jobs and regional growth on the Clyde. It can point to an escort plan that marries ambition to prudence, avoids hard gaps, and leverages partnership to raise the productivity of every pound spent. But political narratives are earned at sea. Delivering ships to the fleet that are quiet when they must be, loud when they choose to be, and always connected to a wider web of allied sensors will decide whether the plan is judged a success by operators rather than observers. In the end, the Royal Navy's frigate renewal reflects a sober reading of the threat and the environment, submarines remain the pacing challenge, the seabed is strategic terrain, and alliance cohesion is a force multiplier. By transitioning methodically from the Type 23 to the Type 26 and Type 31, and by synchronizing with Norway on the same high-end ASW platform, the UK is building not just ships but an ecosystem, industrial, doctrinal, and operational, that is harder to surprise and easier to sustain. If the Ministry of Defence keeps its focus on availability, crew readiness, and interoperable lethality, the outcome will be more than a modern order of battle on paper. It will be a fleet configured for the realities of contested seas, able to meet today's commitments while quietly shaping a less permissive future for any adversary beneath the waves.